So, I want to start by going back to a couple of things that were said last week that I kept thinking about them and I thought, well, I didn't really give an adequate uh, response. One of them was a question uh, Matthew asked at some point during last week's seminar. And it was when we spoke about uh, currency or money. And I said that um, paper money represents value. And I think, if I'm not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matthew, I think you said, but isn't, um, isn't money symbolic of value? Yeah. And, um, and I thought that, yeah, this is a very interesting point. And, and perhaps what we could say, or one way to grasp it might be to say, yes, money is symbolic of value in the same way that the picture of a dog is symbolic of a dog. Does it make sense? I don't want to use the word signifier because, the, well, is it really a signifier or is there a little bit of the dog in the picture, a kind of a trace of the dog in the picture? I mean, what happens in the very typical situation, which to me is the ground zero situation to think about the way photography as a representation operates, what happens when you approach the, the booth in the airport of the, of the border police, yeah, or both the border control, and you show them your passport, yeah? So they open the passport, they hold it like this, you know, and they look at you and at the picture of the passport at the same time, and they're trained to look for similarities between the photograph and the face. And I don't remember exactly, but I think you die about 23, maybe 17, because they always have these evil numbers around this. <laughs> um, um, points of similarity. And if you identify, let's say, less than 13, then you need to do something. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah? So it's, let's say, the, the eyebrows, the distance between the eyes, the shape of the nose, all these kind of things. And they're trained to do it very quickly. These days, we have um, biometric facial recognition algorithms. So sometimes you just stand in front of the camera. But it does the same thing. It looks at the photograph, measures various uh, metrics, looks at the face, measures various met metrics, and compares the results. Yeah? And based on the comparison, you're either allowed through or you're told to wait, to, want to, step, to step to one side and wait. Based on this comparison, um, your identity, well, it's not your identity being established, but a whole you know, your body can find itself in very different circumstances. You're based on that. So what exactly is happening? You know, by what logic? And that, that is a question which I think is, should be asked much more often. But by what logic the picture is said or is presumed to have this power to identify the beholder or the person who who brings the, the, the passport. By what logic makes us recognize the picture as establishing the truth of someone's identity? Don't you think it's a little interesting when you ask it in this way? Yeah? Why is it so? Well, what is the obvious answer? Well, maybe in the past, because with analog, we feel like like hitting, there was like a physical, like not physical, but there was an actual connection and reaction between. Perhaps, yeah, yeah, there, there was all that. But maybe it's something, but how is that to validate that it is the same person? Because it's a representation of you. It's not and how do you know it is a representation? Or similarity. Similarity. Yeah. Okay, that's very important because there is a similarity between the picture and the, per and the person, yeah? Similarity. Okay, so the, so the moment we have photography operating as a representation, and I know that is kind of obvious, but we need to drill down into that. Uh, the question of similarity becomes important. But what is this similarity? What is similarity? When you recognize two things as similar, for instance, Look at the table now in front of you. Can you identify some similar objects? Please. Huh? The laptops are similar. 
why do you think the laptops are more safer than, let's say, the laptop in the coffee cup? Functions. But is similarity really? The shape of the function from, from a photograph of the satellite. So, like the, sh like so the shape is similar. Yeah. And how do we know that the shape is similar? I'm sorry to be so pedestrian with my questions. <laughs> so it's connected with a, like a pattern recognition. Okay, good. That's sort of good. Yeah, yeah. And who? What is needed for pattern recognition to take place? Edges. No. Okay. Edges. Okay. Edges. 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 Who recognizes the pattern? Our eye. Who makes? Who? A brain. What does recognition? Yeah, a brain. Or in, as it also happens, a computer. Yeah. Pattern recognition is the operation of the brain, is the operation of certain logic. Do you see what I'm getting with it? Do you see the, the train of thought that begins from asking, but why the photograph carries some truth value? And if we explore that, we come to realize it is because we presuppose the presence of a computational device that can be the brain or the computer but someone has to be available to make the comparison the comparison between the face and the picture or the comparison between computers or you know the difference between the computer and the coffee is not just standing there like the cup of coffee someone has to think about it, it has to be rationally determined so the notion of photographic truth seems to be requiring that you establish the notion of rational presence in advance. Yeah? And that suggests, again, that it is a very specific notion of truth. As you know already from the seminars and from the lectures, you realize, by the way, that you, work, you have to work twice as hard as all the other students. <laughs> uh, but uh, the the notion of rationality appears in Western culture at a certain moment, around the 17th century, with the, with the scientific revolution, with Depa. And around that time, um, reason because it becomes the dominating organizing force of society. What before it was religion, or faith, or revelation, uh, or the gospel, or the Bible, all these things. Uh, but since then, since about uh, roughly the 17th century, it is rationality. Yeah? So there is a specific historical uh, conjuncture. There is a specific his history to this resemblance between the face and the picture. Yeah? And the, well, why I think it is important? Because it's important not to take this resemblance as a given. Not to take it for granted, not to feel that it is sort of like the gravitational force is always there to rely on. It's only there if we agree that it is there. Yeah? The resemblance, and I, I know it sounds un, in, unintuitive, because this resemblance is something we so believe in. Here is an example of how ridiculous I think it is. You, um, you, you go down the street one day uh, to your nearest coffee shop and you uh, come across a friend who just recently gave birth to twins, identical twins as it happens, yeah? And they, you know, they have this kind of uh, big uh, coats of prams, you know, so they lie side by side. And you look at them and you say, oh my God, they are so similar. But you could also say, oh my God, they are so different. And it would be equally true. So why so automatically we privilege resemblance over difference? Yeah? Why we automatically want to identify the similarity between various things, or let's say the pattern recognition, as we were saying, and not difference? That's something that we will have to discuss later on. But just it, on this little point, that the resemblance between the picture and the face is based on the presence of the rational agent for whom this resemblance is available, or who can think logically 
about resemblance because resemblance is a logical operator. The logical formula of resemblance is A equal A. A equal A. That's the logic of resemblance, also known as the logic of identity. But it's a logic. So can you see now why uh, it's interesting to think about the um, symbolic value of currency as representing certain amount of wealth or capital as not dissimilar to the way the photograph represents a dog or a person. Yeah? So, uh, because we very easily can see how the value of a piece of paper is established by a social code. Yeah? Because obviously, in other circumstances, it's just a piece of paper. Bring it to someone who never saw uh, paper currency, and they will say, well, it's a piece of paper, you know? Um, but we would, we, it's very hard for us to realize that exactly the same thing happens with a photograph. Yeah? It's just that we are so uh, used to taking the photographic resemblance as truth. In that sense, we're really not different from uh, the people in the Middle Ages who just assume that everything is done by God. You know, we just take reason to be this guarantor of truth. Okay, that, that, that's what I wanted to say about uh, last week. Uh, any, any thoughts, anything else came up from after last week's session that you want to, uh, to mention? Okay. Uh, no? Yes? I feel like uh, the power difference, differences between the human image and the human image, which we were talking about the human image, from kind of A equal A, and I don't really kind of have the logic of thinking in the photo for that, but when the image is kind of different, like, People going there, even though you know it's a person, it's a person in there. But if something happens, probably like story, or you feel like it's a person so different from the person in front of your face. I mean, in, in, in the film? Yes. That's right. That's right. I think in the film there are many other kinds of things to take into account. There is the passage of time, there is a narrative and a story. But the reason I took the passport photograph as an example is because I think, as I said, I think this is the most simple, the most binary, the most basic example of how the notion of the photographic image as relating to something real, how it is operated. And something like that is present also in, in a lot of cinema, maybe not in all cinema, uh, and some uh, experimental uh, film is working against this tendency to see the photographic image as necessarily true. Um, but it's just something to think about, you know, what, for what reason in our culture truth and the image seem to be connected? And if that is the case, what, what truth actually means? So these are, these are some, some of the things that uh, will also become uh, and will be in the back of our minds when we turn to, uh, to the text I want to go to you today. And that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is it Heidegger's essay, The Thing, and uh, the point of reference? Yes. From this, um, I think what you have there, if you went to the folder on Dropbox, is this <coughs> from 2010 and 12, the Brennan and Schreiber lectures. Uh, which uh, were, as I already mentioned, the first cycle of lectures I ever gave after, uh, in the 50s, after he was done from teaching for about uh, 10 years. So this is his, um, his return to uh, the public sphere, um, to the role of the public intellectual, if you like. Um, now, how are we doing here for text? Did it, does anyone have, you, you don't have access to the drawbooks already? Oh, did it? Oh, wow, that's, that's very good. Uh, I, uh, everyone has a text? No. no? Not everyone. Fine. Uh, 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 you need to email me, uh, and I will send you the link to the Dropbox. Okay? Uh, but I might uh, try to open it on the screen. Uh, so.
and then by into Joe, we got another good. <laughs> Doubt. Yeah, that's philosophy, you know. 
That's why philosophy gets such a bad name so sometimes. But it is quite funny, isn't it? Uh, so, so doubt becomes the foundation. He bases everything on doubt. But for Heidegger, it's not good enough because he kind of says, but before you doubt, you have to be. So what is this being? What does it mean to be? Yeah? That's the game philosophers play. Not dissimilar also from the games artists play. Everyone tries to outdo the previous character. And in so doing, some doors get opened and others get shut. Um, so you know, it's never a question of trying to argue with a philosopher. It's, a co it's completely pointless. It's like, um, I forgot who said it, was it? Um, I thought they probably was provided, because whenever you're not sure about something, it's usually just provided. Uh, um, actually, it's not him, it's, it's, it's uh, show, no, it's better not show. He said, uh, don't fight with a pig, because you both will get dirty and the pig loves it. <laughs> you both will get dirty and the pig loves it. <laughs> so don't fight with the philosopher, you know? There is really no point. The question is not whether someone is right or wrong, because that's not how you evaluate a philosophical argument. The first question is, is it interesting? It's much more important. And it's also true about art, isn't it? It's much more important for art to be interesting than to be true. Hmm. Yet, yeah, even though I'm using this kind of language, Maybe that's why people like Trump. Uh, maybe. But I don't have to go there now. Uh, <laughs> no, but, 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 but that's something to keep in the back of your mind. And that's something to, um, to keep there in the mix of things. But um, the question about philosophy is not whether, whether someone is right. You will hear around this table some thing that sounds outrageous and crazy and completely not um, nonsensical and paradoxical. And the question is not whether, whether it's true or not. The question is, is it interesting? Can you use it? Is it productive? Can you go somewhere with that? And sometimes the answer might be, no. And that's fine, you know. But it doesn't mean that someone is wrong. It just means that it's not working for you, and then something else will work. Yeah? OK. So, uh, so Heidegger's big question is, what is being? And Heidegger, what does it mean to be? And Heidegger is extremely skilled at turning our attention to the simplest things and showing how the simplest is also the most overlooked. In a sense, it's part of his assault. And I think you know enough about Heidegger already to understand, you know, um, what, um, to understand what I'm going to say. There is a, a, it's part of his assault against rationality and the modern um, logical positivist mindset. Yeah? Because as we saw, we already mentioned Heidegger several times, both here and um, in, in the lectures. Um, for Heidegger, the, the rational mindset of the Enlightenment is both, at the same time, incredibly successful and productive and efficient, and at the same time harboring within it great dangers. And Heidegger sees himself as the person who basically, uh, he often says, my text is a signpost. It just tells you where there is a bend in the road. It just kind of warns you of a hazard. Um, okay. So, let's have a look first at the title. Uh, Brev and Fiber Lectures. Insight into that which is and basic principles of thinking. I'd say it's a lovely title. No? Insight into that which is. And why do you need an insight into that which is? You see, the title is already provocative. It's already calling you, in a sense, um, to take notice. What does it mean to have an insight into that which is? Well, this cup is here, 
the table is here, you are here. What does it mean to have an insight into that? Normally, you know, people talk about having an insight into the structure of the genome, you know, or um, an insight uh, into the root of someone's trauma, if you are a psychoanalyst, you know, you spend a long, long time in conversation with the, with, the, with the client, you know, or you might get, a, you might have an insight into some complex mathematical formula, but he's not talking about any of these complex things, he says, insight into that which is. Can I suggest, we're going to talk about the present. About the, the present. present. That's true. And about what it means to be present. Yeah, about the both the present and the present. That's fine. Okay. So you see, it, it tells you straight from, from the start, this is not about, this is very different from anything that is uh, considered a scientific form of knowledge. Okay, and basic principles of thinking. So do, do you think thinking has principles? Can you have an unprincipled thinking? <coughs> the imagination. Imagination is probably unprincipled. And yet, I think what Heidegger is talking about is not imagination. Henry Bergson, um, who is a kind of cont is, he is contemporary to Heidegger, and he is French, but Heidegger is German. Henry Bergson really says intuition is the forgotten method for um, work, for knowledge. But Heidegger is different. He is not uh, saying intuition. He says thinking. He says thinking has basic principles. And I think he suggests that we don't know the basic principles of thinking, otherwise what would be the point of talking, talk, talking about them? He kind of says, you still don't know how to think. You might think that you think, but you don't know how to think. I think there is another book, which um, I will just mention by the title. And, um, no, it's, 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 uh, no, it's a sentence that he has. He, he repeats it several, on several occasions. And it, and it goes something like this. Says, the most thought-provoking thought in our thought-provoking age is that we are still not thinking. He says, how come that we live in a very thought-provoking time? You know, there's a lot to think about. So how come we still don't know what it means to think? Now, what makes him say that we don't know what it means to think. Well, Heidegger's answer, to put it very briefly, is that as long as we rely on reason, on resemblance, on rationality for our thinking, we still don't think because we don't think the origin of, of reason, resemblance, and rationality. We don't think because we, we always operate from within the framework that was given to us, and we never question the origin of the framework itself and of what is outside of it. Yeah? This is the story in a very broad outline. But things will get very quickly interesting once we get into the text. So the first thing is the point of reference, which is um, one, one and a half well, it's by just one page. And that basically where the question for the whole book <coughs> is get set up. And I, I have 